great to be outside on a day like today. We're out in the fresh air, but most of us spend most of our time in buildings. And with the passive house, you might remember we want really an extraordinary level of air tightness. We want 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 Pascal. That's really, really tight. So how do we get this same fresh air experience into our buildings? Well, believe it or not, the passive house, because it's built to such an airtight level, provides really, really good air quality. And that's through the use of a controlled mechanical ventilation system. So let's have a look at the principles of this and see how it's done in practice. So we've been outside in that lovely fresh air and now we want to try and see right how can we bring that lovely fresh air into our passive house which is built to an incredibly airtight level. And how we do that is with a system like this in the trade is known as a HRV or heat recovery ventilation system and in this video we're going to talk about the benefits of heat recovery ventilation uh, in terms of health and in terms of comfort and also the things to watch out for when you're thinking about fitting a heat recovery ventilation system to your house. We need to think for a second how houses are typically ventilated and often it's a, it's a hole in the wall, for example, with a, a plastic uh, grill on it, or it might be a, a trickle vent in a window. You don't have any direct control over it, so you don't know how much fresh air you're getting in and you're not sure how much stale air you're extracting. The advantage of the Passive House mechanical ventilation system is that it is controlled. and We know how many cubic meters of air per hour we're delivering to the house and how many cubic meters of air per hour we're extracting. The next thing we need to think about is how do we size our flow rate? What sort of air change do we want? And typically what we want is around 0.3 air changes per hour. And that equates to a total of eight air changes per day. So if you can imagine, if you could gather up all the air in your house like a piece of waste paper, dump it and then bring in fresh air eight times a day, that's the ventilation level that we're getting. So let's look at the mechanics of this a little bit further. You'll see now I've actually lifted the bonnet or the hood on this machine because we're going to look at the, the heart of it now in a moment. But before we do that, I'd like to um, point to the ducts or the, uh, the pipework that's connected here to the ventilation system. And in any ventilation system, you're going to have four ducts. Two of those connect with the outside world um, and two of them connect with the house interior. In respect to the ones that connect to the outside world, you have one drawing in fresh air and you have one exhaling, if you like, or, or exhausting the, the stale, humid air. And the same for the two pipes that connect with the house interior. One is supplying all the bedrooms and living rooms and one is extracting from the bathrooms and the kitchen. These four pipes all come together, you can see here, and they all connect to what really is the, the, the lungs, if you like, of not only this ventilation system, but the lungs of your house. And this is called the heat exchanger. I'm going to take the cover off it now and pull out the heat exchanger and you can see exactly what's involved. You can see that was difficult to pull out. That's for a very good reason. It has to be uh, very airtight. Uh, and also well insulated so that we don't lose any energy from this um, heat recovery unit. I'm now going to pull this out. What I want you to think about now is that on one side we've got fresh air coming in from outside, which might be cold, it could be at freezing temperature for example. And on the other side we've got uh, stale air, maybe moist air at 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit coming back from the bathrooms and the kitchen. So you've got cold air coming in, we've got extract air uh, being exhausted, and they pass by each other um, in this heat exchanger, and the heat is donated, if you like, or exchanged from the warm side to the cold side. So the exhaust air is coming through this side of the machine, the supply air is coming in to the other side of the machine, but I want to be very clear, the paths of air don't mix. So there's no contamination whatsoever between the exhaust air and the supply air. We can 
really describe the ventilation system almost like the lungs in your body. And we want to make sure that the air that we breathe into the house is cleaned before it comes anywhere near the ventilation system and before it's delivered to the bedrooms and the living rooms. So we need a filter on the machine. I'm going to show you that now. There's typically two filters in fact. One filter cleans the fresh air coming from the outside and the other filter cleans the exhaust air coming back from the bathrooms and the kitchen before that exhaust air gets into our, the heart of our machine because we don't want to clog up our lungs. So let's have a look now. Um, it's a very simple operation. Um, it doesn't need any sort of technical knowledge at all. You can see here, I'm just simply removing the filter. This is typically uh, what a filter would look like. So I want you to appreciate that the air is passing through here and any particles of dust or pollen or whatever are, are, is collected here. And so the air passing through then on its way to the heat exchanger is completely clean. It's very important that you regularly change the filters and you don't skimp on the cost of doing that. They're not very expensive, so don't try to take them out and just dust them off or hoover them. You really should change them. Um, and you should change them every nine months or a year, depending on the uh, environment that you're living in, depending on if it's very dusty outside or not. Often as well, you'll get a prompt um, on your control panel. Um, this is a control panel, a bit like your smartphone, and it's where you can control the settings of it. Um, but off, often you'll get a warning on this to say that the filter needs to be changed, so you don't have to rely on your memory in that regard. So we've looked at the, uh, the operation of changing the filters uh, once a year. The only other thing you have to think about uh, with your mechanical ventilation system is, is the flow rate. And there are three settings typically that we need to think about. There's a setback mode, there's normal mode, and there's party mode. The setback mode is when you want to um, turn down the flow rate a little bit, and you would typically do that if you're leaving the house for a week or two, such as, for example, on holidays. And that just lowers the ventilation rate, and therefore you're using less power to, to ventilate your house. The normal mode is, is normal uh, and, and is used for 95% of the time. And then party mode is that uh, if you have a party in your house and you want to increase the flow rate, then you can press party mode and the flow rate will increase. Obviously, depending on the, the, the operation that you choose, that will increase the fan speed. And you might be thinking, is it very expensive to run a ventilation system like this? And in fact, it uses really very little power, something like 50 watts. What do you look for when you go uh, to source a ventilation system and what sort of quality assurance should you look for? Really the most critical thing I suppose is the efficiency of the heat recovery unit itself. Um, because the more efficient this is, the more energy you'll extract from the exhaust air and therefore the lower your heating bills will be. So at a very, very minimum, this heat exchanger should be 75% efficient, but in fact, even that wouldn't be a good standard. That's the minimum you need for certification. But there are machines now which are as high as 90 or even 94% efficiency. If the unit is not certified by the Passive House Institute, you must reduce 12% of the manufacturer's stated efficiency. So if we take a machine and the manufacturer says it's 92% efficient in terms of its heat recovery, but that it's not certified by the Passive House Institute, then we're obliged to remove 12% of that. So the efficiency that you would use uh, when modeling it in PHPP would not be 92%, but 80%. The other thing then is the electrical consumption. So we want to make sure that we have good efficiency, but also we're not using a lot of fan power. And again, the maximum amount of energy that can be used per cubic meter of air brought into the house is 0 0.45 watts. So that's another thing. And the other last issue uh, that we might discuss here is the noise level. And if we go really, really quiet now for a second and just listen, this machine is on and the cover is off. So we just listen now. I would describe it as a low hum. 
it's, it's even quieter than your uh, fridge, you know, the noise that your fridge makes when it's charging up. The cover is off this and this machine is normally in your, in your utility room. If we stick with the lung analogy, uh, you can really appreciate how important it is uh, to make a good selection on, on the ductwork that you use to pass this fresh air around your house. On the site visit, we saw a fantastic example of the kind of high quality ducting that's typically used in a passive house project. This is a very interesting view here of the ventilation uh, ductwork in this passive house. And what we can see here, we're going from uh, the main trunk here, which is uh, maybe 150 millimeters diameter to a smaller pipe which is 100 millimeters in diameter and if you look very carefully you see this fat piece of duct here that's called a sound attenuator and the main function of that is to stop crosstalk between what is a bedroom and the living space and this is a very important part of the overall design and setup of the ventilation system in a passive house. Site visit uh, that we showed you, uh, we use this metal spiral bound ducting, and we've got the same in, in this example here. Um, that's a tried and tested uh, method for ducting, and it's, it's extremely good. Another, if you like, more contemporary method that's coming on the market now is to use these uh, plastic pipes. They're a little bit more flexible, they're a smaller diameter, so you can get them into smaller spaces. But what's really critical if you're going to use a plastic pipe like this that it has a special anti-static coating. You shouldn't use a normal waste pipe for example because static will build up on the inside of the pipe and you'll get dust on it. We've discussed the heat recovery unit itself, we've talked a little bit about the ductwork and the last piece of the jigsaw, the last piece of the lungs really, I suppose, is the, uh, the inlet and the outlet that goes on the end of the pipes. It's typically mounted in the ceiling, so the fresh air is coming along the pipe which is hidden and then it hits this saucer and the air spreads out at very low velocity, 360 degrees all around this plate. And if you want to adjust the flow rate, because we're going to set it up for each house quite scientifically, you can actually adjust the flow rate by simply twisting this uh, plate here. And in the end, your engineer will put a device on the end of this pipe and he will be able to tell you precisely how many cubic meters per hour you're delivering to that bedroom or how many cubic meters per hour you're extracting from the bathroom. I think you can appreciate looking at this uh, machine here, it's quite modest in size, it's about the size of an under-the-counter fridge, but where do all the ducts go and how do we fit them in, how do we manage to sort of integrate them in our buildings, because most houses, most buildings don't have a ventilation system. So you need to plan ahead very carefully, where am I going to put my ducts, how am I going to avoid crossover of ducts because that takes up a lot of space, uh, where am I going to put them so they don't get damaged and so forth. And we're going to see that now on the Passive House project that we visited recently. We're here in this rural location in a 280 square metre house where we've just completed the first fix installation of the heat recovery ventilation system. As far as heat recovery ventilation design and installation is concerned, this location here is pretty, fairly ideal. It's in its own designed area for the unit, lots of space and good access to it. The only thing that's very important when we're looking for a location for the unit is to have it as close as possible to the external because that unit needs to take air in from outside which will be very cold in extreme winter and has to exhaust waste air to outside. It's a highly efficient heat recovery unit giving a nominal efficiency of around 90 percent. This is the total system Efficiencies could be higher, but if you take the, the total system into account, this is what you get. And by the total system, I mean all the ducting, both sides of the unit, throughout the house. From the end user's point of view, there are two things which are important, comfort and efficiency. If we take comfort first, sound is a very important part of that. And there are a few things we do to make sure that sound is not an issue. 
First of all, we suspend the unit on light chain from the structure of the building. Secondly, the final duct connections to the unit are of a flexible nature, but it's not ordinary flexible. It's also it's a special acoustic flexible, which kills the sound transmission through the unit. The difference between a heat recovery system in an ordinary low energy house and that in a passive house is that, first of all, it has to be highly efficient, but it also acts often as your heating system. Despite what you might think, a passive house will need heat input at certain times. Take, for example, deep winter when it might be minus 10 or below. This is when your heat recovery ventilation starts to work even more efficiently. If you have 20 degrees returning from your house and you have minus 10, minus 15 even coming in from outside, you find that the air coming off the heat recovery system is at up to around 18 degrees, even with the low temperatures outside. This 18 degrees is not adequate to do any heating. It just takes the chill out of the air. It then passes through this unit, which is actually the heating system for the house. By the time the air reaches this unit, it's at around 18 degrees, and it, when it gets through it, it goes up to the low 30s. At this stage, it's capable of doing a heating function. Inside this module we've just looked at, this heating module, you'll find one of these. This is a hot water coil. It relies on hot water from a source, usually at around 60 degrees C, circulating through the unit and returning back to the source. The source of the hot water in this case is a 1,000 litre buffer tank. This buffer tank takes its heat from a combination of a wood stove and solar panels. As well as comfort and efficiency, your heat recovery ventilation unit also gives you one more very important benefit, that is good indoor air quality. It does this by utilising filters. These filters do two jobs. They clean the air and they also keep the heat exchanger itself clean and efficient. We talked a lot about uh, using the equipment uh, for heat recovery, but in fact we also need to think about using ventilation equipment in a warm climate. And there's two things that we can use to try and keep the air at a nice cool temperature. The first is what's called a summer bypass and there's a way on this machine that you can set it during the summer time that the air from outside doesn't pass through the heat exchanger but in fact bypasses this heat exchanger and goes straight to the bedrooms. So you can have nice cool fresh air being delivered directly to the bedrooms to keep the temperature down in the summer time. And if we have the added challenge of humidity in the air, for example, as we have in parts of the United States, they tend to, to use not a heat recovery ventilation system, but an ERV, or an energy recovery ventilation system. And this is uh, quite a big difference between this normal machine that we see here that we use in cool tempered climates, and the added advantage of an ERV is that it actually helps to reduce the humidity of the air being brought into the house. Passive houses need a tiny fraction of the heating uh, compared to a normal building, but they do need some heating. And we've seen in this video uh, how much effort you've put in, in installing the duct system. So typically the duct system or the ventilation system is used, used to deliver the heating that you need to your bedrooms and your living space, in fact to the whole house. There's no point in putting in another infrastructure of radiators or under floor heating when you've already paid for the infrastructure of the ventilation system. So bearing that in mind, what you might be wondering is, well, I mean, how can I heat up the air that's passing around the house? And we'll discuss that later in this series on passive houses.